Hello, I'm Councilwoman Michelle Lombardi. Welcome to April's Eye on Piscataway. This month's show will be about senior scams. We have three guests today. Today I have with me Camille Fernicola, Joel Schneider, and Kyle Weaver. I'll read a little bit about each one of our guests so we can get to know them a little bit better. And then we're gonna have a, a great show with a lot of information for our, um, I don't even wanna say it's for only for seniors. I think uh, all age people are being scammed today. Um, and really, um, it's not just uh, our seniors that are being scammed. Because I looked up a little bit of information on the internet, and it said that the, the age where the most people are being scammed is anywhere from 18 and on up. So I think it's a, a huge problem today, and we have some great people here to discuss that topic. So um, Camille Fernicola, moved to Piscataway in 1972, where she and her husband raised their three children. She served as a council member for 15 years and a county freeholder, now called county commissioner, for 12 years. She is now active in our community and senior issues. Thanks for coming on the show, Camille. My pleasure, thank you. Joel Snyder, for the past two years, Joel Snyder has been the outreach specialist for the Senior Medicare Patrol of New Jersey. This is a federally funded position from Medicare and Medicaid programs and is part of his job with Jewish Family Services of Middlesex County. Originally from New York City, he is a 1976 graduate of Bronx High School of Sciences and a 1980 graduate of Binghamton University. Welcome to the show, Joel. Thank you very much for having us. And then we have Kyle Weaver. Det Detective Sergeant Kyle Weaver has been with the Piscataway Police Department for nearly 15 years. Almost nine of these years have been in the Detective Bureau in which he has assignments with the Middlesex County Nar Narcotics Tax Force, his graduate of Piscataway High School, and Rutgers. He has his wife and three children here in Piscataway, all longtime residents of Piscataway, and he's a big Rutgers fan. So welcome to the show, Kyle. Thank you. Sounds like we have a lot in common. Sure Long, <laughs> long time Piscataway residents. Okay, so um, again, the show is about scams and uh, seniors being scammed. And I, I, as I said, a lot, I think all ages are being scammed right now. So um, why don't we talk a little bit about um, some of the problems that you've run into, Camille? All right, uh, most recently one day the phone rang and of course I answered it. I have caller ID. And I didn't recognize the name, but I just answered it. And the person on the other side was a gentleman. And he started asking me about my Medicare ID number and who my doctor was. And I was, he had some information, but whatever he didn't have sort of raised my um, anticipation of, problems. Right. So I was hesitant and he started trying to pull it out of me, the information. And finally, after about five minutes, and that's a long time when you're on the phone with a stranger. I don't know why I stayed on the phone. Right. But finally, I said, send me a letter and I hung up. <laughs> but I later thought about it. I called the mayor's office and um, Jean told me that if, if I um, tried to dial the number, because I have a dialer ID, I'd find that that number was disconnected, and sure enough, right. it was. That's perfect. And I um, started getting a little annoyed with myself because I always warned my mother, she died at 96, but don't talk to people on the phone. I know, and you, you, and you do. You, you know, we know this a lot of times, but sometimes when the phone rings, right. it, I would say, especially seniors, okay, you're caught off guard. Right, Okay. exactly. You're really caught off guard. And they're trained right. to uh, squeeze the information out of you. Right, right. So. Well, it's more than trend, if I can jump in for, of for course, a second. Of course, Joel. This is an incredible, typical way especially during open enrollment, which happens between October 15th and December 7th, 
And then we have a second open enrollment, which most people don't know about, which is March th for, uh, January 1st to March 31st. Right. So these scammers, they get you on the phone, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to discern all of your information. Now, they could have all of your information, but if they don't have one piece of information, they can't play you. If they have all your information, your Medicare number and everything else, but they don't have your birth date, right. they can't put a claim in with Medicare. Oh. What happens is these people are calling you and they're attempting to do two things. They're attempting you to switch if you want a Medicare Advantage program, and I can explain to you why they would want you to switch, mm -hmm. or they're intending to get your information so that they can become you. Because once they have all your information, they put claims in with Medicare or Medicaid, and it doesn't come with your picture, it doesn't come with your fingerprints, it comes with your Medicare number, right. it comes with your, your doctor. Do well, it comes with your date of birth, it comes right. with your information. Sometimes it may come with your doctor if your doctor ordered a particular medical procedure or particular equipment for you. That's what he, he asked me about my doctor's name. So that had something to do with And the other the thing scam. that they're looking to try and do to you is you're talking to them and you say the word yes. And they've now been able to interpret that word yes as you have given them permission to change your insurance plans. And all of a sudden you get a letter in the mail two weeks later, you've changed your insurance plan. Right. So the moral of this story is you never pick up the phone. It doesn't matter if you... If you recognize the number and it's somebody who you know, obviously that's a call you want to get. Right. If you don't recognize the number, and we saw a lot of this during the COVID, because right. a lot of our seniors were home by themselves and they were pining for any kind of human activity, right. and they would pick up the phone. Right. Huge mistake. Because I try to say that all the time to my mom. The mm. thing about Whatever these you people... Do. If you yeah. don't recognize the telephone number, don't answer it. Right. Let them leave a message. Right. Right. If they leave the message and it's somebody that you have to call back, then you can call them back. We make a joke during our workshops. First of all, you have a built-in secretary. You have something that business people pay thousands and thousands of dollars for. Everybody has a cell phone these days. You should shut that off. And Well, it, it is. <laughs> and with your cell phone, though, you've created, every time you put something in here, you create two-factor authentication for yourself, ah. which is what everybody should try and attempt to do to protect their personal information all the time. And I know that you'll want to talk a lot about that because that's another step where you're protecting it mm. in a lot of ways that you could do that. But you're going to pick up that phone in the old days, and when I say the old days, a week ago, you could have said, oh, that phone call looks like it's from Yugoslavia. But they are so good at it technologically these days. It could look Sometimes like it came it's a from phone your next number. door neighbor. Yeah. Sometimes it's a phone number of, of nearby. I've noticed that lately. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yes. when the phone numbers come in, like you said, it's not a foreign country. It's, it's not, not anymore. It's not a, 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 ze a zip code or area code that's from far away. It's a number that's similar. And then you think you call up Verizon or T-Mobile and say, put a block on my phone for all the spam numbers. And you do that. And most of us know how to do that. This day. I didn't and know we, that. You could do that for any one of your carriers. But here's the thing. Even when you do do that, this is a cat and mouse game. And I'm sure you know a lot about this. My father used to tell me about you paint the bridge. And when you paint the bridge, it takes 10 years to paint the bridge. So what do you do when you're done? Start you got to start all over again, right? It's the same thing yeah. with the cybersecurity stuff. You sure. find a way to stop them, they find a way to get around it. Yeah. It's a cat and mouse game. So you always have to be on guard. Because like you said earlier, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that point, human beings, since the day they learned how to talk, learned how to defraud somebody else. Yeah. You look up it's fraud in the Webster's Dictionary, it's a right? shame. It's but a that's shame. homo sapiens. It's right. human beings. Yeah. There's been somebody in some cave or some boiler room, or something somewhere, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to steal from us since the day we learned how to talk. So you have to always be on guard for yourself. Yeah, It's a shame. You yeah. said it you earlier. You have to pay attention. You just have to pay. You can't, you can't live in fear. You can't be scared all the time. You just have to be paying attention. You have to be to aware. What's, what's, be aware and be paying attention. So uh, I, Kyle, I wanted to yeah. just um, touch on what, what we are saying with the, the caller ID number showing up. Uh, there's apps that you can download that I could download and I could, it's called spoofing a number. So I could 
uh, call you on your cell phone and it's going to show up and say Piscataway Police Department, right. even though I'm calling from my cell phone. And I could make it uh, South Plainfield Police Department or any any agency, the IRS, uh, you know, Medicare, whoever it I could have a be. Landline. So a landline, a landline will help you at least block that out because if it's on a cell phone and that applies to anybody who has a cell phone with spoofing, they'll call up and and it looks convincing. It's seven three two five six two eleven hundred, which is a police number. So that way, when the pe- person is like, "Oh, this seems suspicious to me," let me call back and answer or and call. Now you have a dispatcher answering, so it kind of validates, and they think, oh, okay, it really was a police officer calling me or someone from dispatch. So then they feel more obligated to the next time that that number calls to give them their information. Um, so it's not always just a random number. It could be a number that it looks and legit. a good way to deal with that as well is if you're not sure, and the phone call comes through and you pick it up because you're not sure, right. the easiest thing to do, give me your phone number, I'll call you back. If they said they're from the police department, IRS, Social Security, Medicare, and you call them back and they're the ones who answer the phone. Then you're a good then, shape. Well, there's <laughs> 7 million people who are in Social Security. You know, right. you may have an issue. If you call the police department back and you know that's the number and then that guy answers the phone because he's a dispatcher, then you know you've got a good police officer. Right. I, I had one uh, the other day that someone called my desk line. Uh, they're saying, hey, is, is there an officer trying to reach out to me right now because I'm on the phone with someone on the other line who's claiming to be a Piscataway officer wow. and that they're looking for my personal information. Wow. And, uh-huh. and I said, in that case, no, there's, there's no call at your house. There's no, we didn't just go to your house. There's no reason that a detective or an officer would be doing a follow-up with this person. They just called you uh, hoping to get information out of you. Right. And a, a, one of our um, a big indicator in that case was that the person was referencing our old G5 own who has been retired for about 10 years now. So, but that's where they found the information on the internet somewhere saying that Ivone is our chief. Uh, so they're using this information to try to make it sound more valid wow. to, the, to the victim saying, hey, look, so see, I what, do know. That's what I wanted to talk a, a little bit about, Kyle. What are the things, what are some of the things that you see coming in at, to the police station these days? Um, this time of year with it being tax mm-hmm. season, a, yeah. common fra- a common scam is, is someone calling, claiming to be from the IRS, saying that there's an issue with your bank account information that's on record. So they're looking to update the bank account information so that way they're getting the account information right. from you so that they can uh, then they have access to your bank account. Right away, you kind of know there's something suspicious with that because how often is the IRS going to call you? Zero. Right. The IRS, Social Correct. Security, Medicare, the, Medicaid, never I, I, I have that people. out there. The right. IRS never, never. calls right. they're, they're not, you on the telephone. Me, Medicare is not calling me saying there's right. a problem with payment. Right. It's always the other way, just like any kind of insurance or, or bank issue or whatever the case is where I have to call. I have to be the one to initiate it and call and say, uh, you know, I didn't receive my payment from my tax return this year. The IRS isn't going to do me the favor and say, hey, uh, we can't pay you, right? They're hoping that maybe I didn't declare, and, you know, and that goes to a different set of issues, but um, they are going to reach out to me, right? It's going to be on me to reach out to them. And, and you kind of summed it up best when you said, send me a letter. Right. All these bigger companies, right, they're still going to communicate through through written uh, forms of communication right. for, you know, your cell phone carriers or, again, the IRS or, um, you know, st- state uh, tax offices or township tax offices, right? They're going to send you the little postcard about if you're owed taxes or whatever the case is. They're not going to call, uh, you know, on the phone and say, hey, you, you know, we owe money. Or they're not, a, a common fraud would be to call you and say, hey, you're short on your property taxes. I'm Michelle Lombardi. Please um, make sure you, you're paying your taxes and here, put it into this account. Right. She, so she's not mor- calling. So the moral to this piece that we're talking is, they never call you on the telephone, the IRS. Never, never, right. never. Okay. So, so well, what really... should I do? Should I now, I don't know how much information I gave them. I don't think I gave them very much, but they wanted to know my doctors. The my first thing that you doctor. must do always, first thing, no matter what you do, no matter what, you get your Medicare number changed, period. You call up 1-800-MEDICARE and you say, I want my number changed. No matter what they tell you on the other end of the phone, because you might hit a $15 an hour person who's their third day on the job and doesn't understand what's happening, because that's America today, you have the right to demand a new Medicare card. Now, if you take a look at your Medicare card, it's a completely randomly generated number. Mm -hmm. Seven years ago, if you looked at your Medicare card, it was your social security card, it was your social security number. Sorry to say, how dumb was that? Because right. that follows you till you're dead. Right. Now you've got the Thank situation you. where you suspect. You don't even know. You suspect. You call 1-800-MEDICARE seven days a week, 24 hours a day. 
Or better yet, you download the Medicare.gov app and put it in your phone. Yes. And you put in a claim that somebody stole your Medicare number. You need a new one. Okay. Do you know how well, many times Camille you could do that? Doing, Camille will be doing that later on this afternoon. I can guarantee you. Do you know how many times you could do that in your life? Well, that we learned. You can do that. it as many times in your life as you need to do that. And you will never lose your health records because your health records follow you through your Social Security number, which is attached to this Medicare number, whatever it is. And every time I go to the doctor, they ask for my uh, Medicare card. Well, here's a great well, that, way, that's a good way to not to be defrauded, it. okay? Right. Here's another thing. You have a secretary in your hand. You still drive? And you yes. confirm this to me because you're a police officer. <laughs> so yes, you carry. Still drive. Do you have your driver's license on you? It's in my purse. Do you carry your social security card? Yes. Do you carry your no. medical cards? Yes. Everything. Okay, well, here's what you should do no. you should take a picture of it, uh. text it to yourself. We never text ourselves. So in any emergency, you're going to need that information. So let's say officer stops you on the road. You're doing 65, young lady. You should not have been, but you did. He stops you and says, I want to see your driver's license. You pull out your driver's license, both sides of it is texting, and can you confirm that that is a legal document to show you? Uh, I mean, it's a good reference. A, a driver's to, license you can't so, show on the phone, but an insurance card you could. Well, according to the state of New Jersey, the Supreme Court, my understanding is that's a legal document. Really? It, that's a New Jersey legal document. Well, that's something and we have to show. figure out here. The, the other, the other yeah. thing, um, just with like keeping your social security card on you, there, there's no reason to keep that on you. No, no reason. Yeah, oh, I, did I, I say I do? I yeah, no. No. I just have it memorized. Now, what happens okay. is, you're, if you I lose your remember. pocketbook or you get it stolen, you're going to have to have all, all those your, documents. All your replaced. documents are in yeah. there. Here's yeah. the beauty of having it in here. Yeah. You've created two-factor authentication. But what if somebody steals your phone? Nothing is foolproof. But if they steal your phone, can they get it in your phone? Uh uh. Yes. No, because you have a passcode. I don't remember it. Well, they won't remember it if you don't remember it. But you've no, created, I, again, two-factor authentication for yourself. I don't forget on my phone. I don't need a passcode. So here's the second moral then to the story. Then you should add a passcode. You have to have a passcode on your telephone. Would you recommend that for Do you? Somebody? Oh, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Everybody has it Somebody's now. You need to have, to have that. Somebody's going to show me. Grandchildren, that's what they're good for these days. I don't know how to do it. I go to your grandchildren. Who knows technology? So speaking of, uh, speaking of grandchildren, that's going to bring up another topic of things that I started looking for when we were talking about this show. So I don't know that it's ever happened to you, but that's another scam that's out there for some of our seniors, or not only just a senior, but somebody gives them a phone call. And I don't know if, uh, Kyle, you, on that one. you've ever had this come to the police station, but somebody calls you on the telephone and they are acting like it's your grandchild right. and that they need help. They're in a dire situation they want $5, and they need, they need money to get out of jail. And do you know how it makes somebody feel on the other end when they think that it's a family member or a grandchild you know that, I, is in, it, that is in trouble? You know and what you I want tell to help the guy? Yeah. Call his mother. You know what you should do? But the simple solution mother. to that, once again, it's really very simple if you stop to think about it. Okay, give me your phone number, well, or I'm going to call my granddaughter right yeah. now to find out what's going on. Instead of, see, here's what's going on. If you take everything out, if you go to the fundamental root causes of what's happening, these people are trying to manipulate your behavior at all times. Right. So if you give up that, if you let them manipulate your behavior, you will be defrauded. So if you are aware and you stay aware and you understand that if you don't understand something, that you just don't go along with somebody because they say something or do something. The key to this whole thing is if you're on your computer and red lights start going off and buzzers start going off and they say to you, click this button, your life will be saved. They tell us all the time. Oh, no. The that worst thing in the world too. is to click that button because you click that button, they're gonna, you're going to let them in your device. Right. Moral of story, they're always trying to manipulate your behavior. With it the phone call, yes. with every step of the way, if they're manipulating your behavior, you're allowing them to lead you. 
So you have to be on guard all the time. It's unfortunate that's the world we live in. I got caught on the computer. I oh, don't that, know. That was another, that's a whole another topic. Uh, all right. How they, no, how they start getting into your technology. Kyle, go uh, ahead. I was just going to comment with the with the phone call thing where uh, they're trying to say there's some kind of dire situation. A very common one mm. is that it'll be someone who claims that you're, uh, your daughter. Now they don't know anything about you, so they're going to throw this out. It's like fishing, they right? They used my grandson's name. Oh, uh, so I was. So then maybe they, they did, they did a, little a little more. But research. that's a very common technique. What they're doing is they're they're trying to drop your defenses by right. relating to you so, that you know somebody. So what they'll do is they'll they'll call and say that your your daughter was involved in a car accident in New York City. Yes. There's been injury. They'll even go as far as to have like a child or a baby crying in the background. So oh. so it's playing you know on your emotions and say hey there's this injury, but we have a great deal for you. If you send us $5,000 right now, it'll right. get rid of attorney fees and court costs, and we won't have to worry about going to court, and everything will be settled. And again, now your emotions are high. Look what we were saying yes. before. Your emotions are high. You hear a baby crying yeah. in the background, and you say, oh, my goodness, uh, let me just let me help out my daughter. Right. In those cases, right, most of the time, you're going to end up getting a call. Like, it, if, if, you were involved, if your daughter's involved in an accident, she probably would have called you herself right you would actually know her it's not gonna be some random person calling Hopefully saying oh by the way her husband. or her husband but or whoever they really it is. Get, they get your emotions <laughs> right. all wound so you're up. not you're not thinking Better quickly call her husband that's what he's there for and and you said it and with your other phone call they're very pushy right so they're yes. trying to get that information as yes. quickly as possible so that way you don't have time to really sit there and digest they're it and insistent. think about it so right. very yes. interesting because so, that's part of the technique of controlling your behavior. Your emotions. Right. They're pushing you so they're you working, don't have time to think. Making you work yeah, up absolutely. your emotions. Absolutely. So Kyle, do you find a lot of people are starting to report these kind of activities? Because I think sometimes people are embarrassed. They don't want to admit that that kind of thing happened to them. But are more people starting to report that? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we, we take reports for something like this probably almost every other day. Where we're okay. taking some kind of fraud. But Again, what can you do about it? Uh, the best thing to do uh, is, to, is to make the police report. If Sometimes there's follow-ups we can do. Sometimes a lot of times there's not because they're coming from overseas and, right, and you right. know South Asia and, and call centers. Accent. Right. The, the biggest Nothing thing against the, the biggest thing I, I would recommend would be to go on uh, there's a website it's called ic3.gov and that's something um, that the FBI monitors and that eventually when there's enough certain type of fraud or a certain amount of money that keeps going to the same areas in, in the world uh, they'll start an investigation and that's how they end up taking down these call centers yeah, in different parts of the they'll world. They'll find the patterns what they do these uh, days. Uh, but but again we do, we do take uh, reports probably every other day and it's not just elderly people it's it's younger people also especially you mentioned about 18 year olds yeah. uh, it's common with social media that um, right. a person posing as a you know a female is is talking to some uh, young male and gets and they think they're in some kind of relationship and eventually they end up uh, sharing in inappropriate pictures with each other uh. and as soon as those pictures go to the to the fake account that person is now threatening how hey, we're going to uh, post pictures of your, you know, naked pictures of right you all now. over the internet, unless you send us five thousand right. dollars, uh, and that's a that's a scam that we're seeing right. more and more Somebody with younger people. Somebody putting themselves in a position yeah. to do something like that. You shouldn't so, put yourself so, in that position. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, we've uh, we've covered a lot of different types of scams that are going on out there. So number one would be like well, the I wanted Medicare. Well, to bring up in, yeah. in one particular one sure. that's happening right now, and just to go back to seniors for a second. Right. Um, the first thing, if, in your case, or in that person's case, if they're on Medicare or Medicaid, if you divulge any of your personal information, the first thing that you need to do is you need to make a report to Medicare or Medicaid or your health insurance. Because you must stop the frauds of them stealing from you because it won't stop. And it will continue on, and you're the only person in the world who could stop it. Because at the end of the day, Every person in America gets an EOB, an explanation of benefits letter or a medical summary notice, one to three months after they've had a procedure. And that will tell the, the individual what services and products they received during that time period. And outside of that letter, it's unfortunate, but it says this is not a bill. Right. Because yeah. we don't want our seniors to be confused Correct. thinking it's a bill because it's not. We don't want them to pay it. It's an information statement. So if anybody out there has a good idea how we can change that, please let us know. But what that ends up leading to is things like this. People don't open up their explanation of benefit letter. 80% of American garbage. So I'm going to throw out to you, audience, something that's incredibly amazing to me when I found out about this, or I will ask the panel first. How much do you guys think 
This country wastes in fraud, waste, and abuse in the Medicare, Medicaid, health care system. Just throw me out a number. Well, no, I did a little research, Give me but a... I didn't do the Medicare one. I just did the research on how much money people are being scammed of on various different scams, and that's amazing in itself. So it's not just Medicare, but there are some other well, um, in the whole healthcare logistics. system. Right. It's estimated by Congress, and this is a report that was done by the New York Times and 469 federal agents that police the system, that we throw out 100 to $125 billion every year out the window. Right. Now, how do we do this? Well, part of the problem is people don't open up that explanation benefits letter, that medical summary notice, right. because that's going to tell you what your services were. And the government doesn't know it's not you or not. So oh. if you went, let me finish right. the point. Yes, sir. So if somebody put in a colonoscopy under your name yes. because they have your information, then you need to go for colonoscopy. Guess what? Well, you're, gonna, you're only allowed one out of every five years. It. You're going to get it, but you're going to have to pay for it to be aggravated. Let me just finish. Let me. me. <laughs> I have, believe me, it's not fun. But what happens is that hundred to hundred and twenty-five billion that I just told everybody out. <laughs> That's so huge. We don't, we are, we like, it's like, what? You kidding? What can I do about that? Nobody can do anything about that. It's so huge. But the problem is it affects you directly because you lost your colonoscopy. But let, let me just. Why don't you say. Go ahead. Tooth problem or something. I'm sorry. We use, we use colonoscopy because we have a little joke there. It goes oh, no. in and it comes out That's good. That's a joke. That's a okay, joke. No, you know? I don't laugh at that. But, but let me, let, but me, let me just wait bring a up. Go ahead. If I call Medicare, how do they know it's me? If, if, if you I call Medicare, they're going to ask you a certain number. about a s certain questions that you will only answer to the Medicare person because you're initiating the call. So okay. the, you'll you'll be able to identify yourself uh, through your number, help. your birth date, and other your parent, your mother's maiden name. They have all of that, and okay. that's how they do it. So let's wrap up with some really bullet point ideas of how our residents can um, protect themselves from scamming. So, my first suggestion Medicare always problem. is use your technology to your advantage. So leave your driver's license home, leave your Medicare card home, because if yeah. you lose them, you have double authentication. Do not answer the phone if you do not recognize who it is. Yeah, let your secretary get it. Mm -hmm. If you find that they left you a message and you want to return that call, you take control of everything. You must be in control of your health care and your financial life. And just the way you open up your credit card bill every month, we all open up our credit card bills because we don't want credit card companies to steal one more nickel than they take from us. You need to open up your medical summary notices and your explanation of benefits letters and make sure that the services and products that they're saying you got, that you actually got, and that you're not sending $256 million to the Pink Pussycat Boutique. That's good. <laughs> Kyle. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, kind of what we were saying, uh, what we talked about earlier, right? The No one is ever going to call you and solicit for information. Um, that's one of the things. Uh, there's a couple other red flags I just wanted to hit on real quick. Um, one of the things we see a lot is that if, if for some reason you did start believing what the person's telling you, a uh, common thing of if you're going to give money to someone, they're asking you to go to a Walmart or Target and go get gift cards. Gift cards, that's right. So um, that's, the, the IRS is not going to call you or, or Medicare is not right. going to call you and say, please send our agent $5,000 in Google gift cards right. or an Apple gift card. So or that's like a red get flag. get back into your computer. So that, that's another great, that's, that's a great it. example also with like ransomware yeah, and stuff. Um, so that that's another red flag. And then again, another red flag is uh, someone coming to your house to uh, look for $10,000 in cash. I mean, again, what we were talking about where I, I that I have to go to the IRS to, to go and work things out. And they're never going to come to my house and say, uh, hey, here, uh, we need money from you or, or Medicare or whatever agency it might be. Um, they're never going to come to my house and say, let me make it convenient for you, right? It's, we're the ones who are inconvenienced if, right. if our money isn't going to where it's supposed to. Um, so those are my, my big red flags. And the other thing, people are knocking on doors selling things today. Right, yes. right. In point. order to be doing that, they are supposed to have a permit. Right, 100%. Correct. Yep. So there's a lot of people knocking. Solar panels. Solar panels, door-to-door -door knocking. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes they're trying to sell them something and they're not even a valid sales right. people. That, that's a good way to a case. New roof. Uh, right. Have you, have you learned something today, Camille? A little bit? 
Yes. That's a great thing. I have. <laughs> okay. Do you have anything that you'd like to finish with? Well, everybody's got to be careful. It's not just elderly people. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's young. It's, you know, we, we try to trust everybody and it doesn't work. You and just so, and, you know, and sometimes. Especially on the phone. Right. And sometimes family members should also try to help some of their senior, um, you know, parents and right. stuff be um, aware of their bank accounts right. and things like that. So. I really Tell them to call their mother. Oh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Don't I call your grandmother. I think call it was mother. an. Uh, I, I was just going to throw one other thing out the, there. Uh, my personal phone number is seven three two five six two two three one eight. If you have any questions with anything that you think maybe it's suspicious, you can always call me directly. Again, uh, like the example I gave, someone called us the other day, called me specifically, and saying I think I might be in the middle of getting scammed, which he was. So again, if you think there's something going on, you could always call me. If I'm not at my desk, you could always call our general number and an officer will come to your house and try to guide you through if, if there's an thank issue you that so much. you think there's a, some kind of issue going on. Good information. Thank you. Thank resource. you. And I think yes. that everybody learned a lot here today. I think it was a lot of great information. And I want to thank all of you guys for coming on to the show for the month of April. Thank, thank you, you, thank you so much. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Great topic. Thank you all for joining us on I Am Piscataway. Next up, we're going to see events that happened around town. And we'll return to the studio with Senator Smith. down here at, at Stelton Sports on this beautiful spring day here to celebrate Sid Doss and families opening of, of the newest recreational facility in Piscataway. It's a pickleball place, batting cages, uh, softball, and cricket training. So if you feel like you want to burn some calories off and you're not at the community center, come here to Stelton, Stelton uh, Sports right here and they'll put you your primary physicians will be happy with all the exercise you're going to get there. So, so, so do you want to say something, Sid? Yeah, sure. First of all, thanks to the mayor and the township uh, leadership here. Thanks for taking the time out. Uh, we're very excited to bring multiple sports uh, in Piscataway, Sports Town USA. As uh, when we met Robert the first time, he helped us explain that. <laughs> so I do want to thank you, the town and uh, Delio Properties Equity Land Group for allowing us to do this here. We're very excited to support the community. Now that, that's great, and I want to introduce, we have our council president, uh, Gabrielle Cahill, and also First Ward Councilman Frank Hearn. Do you want your family to come in too, to help uh, cut the ribbon? One, two, three. Yeah. There you go. So congrats, they're officially open. It already looks like people are burning calories off here already. Right there. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the tour. Hello, everyone. Bob Smith, your state senator. 
your former assemblyman, your former mayor, your former councilman. I know many of uh, the listening audience, and I'm thrilled to be sitting in to today for the mayor um, to talk about some of the really progressive climate change policies that the town of Piscataway is leading the way for other towns in the state of New Jersey. For anyone in the audience who believes that climate change is a hoax, shame on you. And the reason I say shame on you is the proof is really undeniable. And not, a, not just talking about big picture items, like 2023 was the hottest year in human history. Or the past month, past two months ago, f the February, was the hottest February in the history of mankind. The melting glaciers, the forest fires. You may remember last summer you couldn't breathe for three weeks because of the smoke from Canada. All of that stuff is happening. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, half the state of Texas was burning down. The proof is everywhere. But if you need more proof, let me just mention a couple of historic events for the state of New Jersey and Piscataway Township. In 2011, Hurricane Irene, we had a billion dollars in damage in New Jersey. Of that, private insurers paid out approximately $915 million to cover damage from the storm. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy, Overall, there was $36 billion in damage. Uh, the insured market incurred losses of $4.5 billion. Uh, in New Jersey, we had over 470,000 insurance claims, uh, which was broken down to 337,000 homeowner claims and 56,000 auto claims. You may remember Tropical Storm Fay, another th uh, $350 million. Uh, Hurricane Ida, 2021, not so long ago, over $2 billion in damages. Uh, in Somerset County, there were 13,228 insurance claims. Uh, they were made for $164 million in losses. In Middlesex County, during Hurricane Ida, 14,000 claims were filed for $155 million in damages. And we lost 29 people. 29 people drowned in New Jersey in uh, two, 2021 as a result of Ada. And I'm not talking about the wildfires. Uh, one of the smart things that the commissioner of the DEP is currently doing is doing uh, pre preventative burns. In other words, he's taking small parts of the forest that are dried out, kindling, and doing a preventative burn so the forest fires don't get out of control. And even with that, last summer, we had some pretty big forest fires in New Jersey. So if you're not convinced after all that, that we've got a global climate change problem, shame on you. Uh, the way to try and get our species to survive is to reduce our climate footprint. And what that means is reduce the carbon dioxide and the methane and the nitrogen oxides that are going into the air. One of the major ways to do that is by uh, using renewable solar, wind, or other energy sources that don't come from fossil fuels. And that's why tonight uh, we have as our guest Dan Riggle. Dan is from uh, Snyder Electric. Snyder Electric is a huge electric uh, conglomerate that is in all sections of the renewable energy world and doing a lot of good things in, uh, in New Jersey. And as a matter of fact, we're going to be talking about one of the new renewable projects here in Piscataway, and he's going to talk to us all about it. Dan, let me start with, tell us about your company and what you do, and then we'll talk about Piscataway. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with you, Senator, and, and thank you for giving this issue the proper context and, and the urgency. It is a big uh, big issue and really the reason why I got into the industry, so I'm happy to hear you give it that uh, the intro it deserves. Um, so yeah, Schneider Electric, we're a global energy management company and sustainability company. We work when, in all different industries and sectors, but really our goal is to help people uh, you know, make the most of their resources and become more sustainable. Uh, so I'm with our public sector business unit, so we focus on all different sorts of projects and solutions 
for public entities in particular, right? So municipalities like uh, Piscataway, larger cities, the federal government, uh, school districts, universities, really any public institutions, we're trying to help them on their sustainability goals, help them address uh, energy efficiency targets, uh, trying to drive cost savings by becoming more efficient. Um, so that's really what we do. You know, we work with uh, local leaders who, who want to make a change, want to improve their facilities, become more sustainable, and, and there's a lot of different ways that we do that through projects, through services, uh, through new, renewable energy solutions. So um, really runs the gamut, but uh, the focus is on helping to empower our, our local leaders to really make uh, make a positive impact when it comes to sustainability. Right. Now, you used the word empower. Is that, yeah. a, double, is that a pun that you uh, were it, throwing it, it into your... It slips out every once in a while, but it, it really is, uh, you know, multiple meetings, so to speak. So, talking a little bit about Piscataway and, and the leadership that it's had over the years, before this new project, we already had a pretty substantial solar project here in Piscataway. Mm -hmm. The roof of our public works center is covered with solar panels. Mm -hmm. It's been there for years. And if you ever have the opportunity, this t talking to the citizens, to walk into the public works center, you'll see a, a big uh, flat screen TV showing the energy that's being produced and consumed uh, in the public works center. And the great news for the taxpayers, reduces your tax bill. Mm -hmm. You're getting, uh, you're not buying oil or natural gas, using sunlight to power the public work center, which is a great thing. That being said, it's been there for a couple of years. And um, as everybody knows, uh, President Biden managed to get the Congress to uh, pass the IRA bill. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that bill is being used to help us to catch up on our, the energy problem that we have in the, in the United States. Uh, we're blessed to have not only a progressive mayor and council, but also a very progressive congressman named Congressman Frank Pallone. Mm. And Congressman Pallone was uh, a key person in getting us a new $250,000 Energy Department grant, mm -hmm. which is going to be used for a new project. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us about the new project? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're looking at solar being installed at, at really any of the township facilities that were feasible, right? So we looked at the entire uh, swath of projects and the $250,000 uh, federal grant, thanks to um, uh, Senator Pallone, is to... Congressman Pallone. Excuse me. Maybe someday. Yes, all right. Congressman Pallone, excuse me. Uh, so this grant will be used specifically at the public safety facility. So uh, if you look at the town hall complex and then public safety next door, uh, the, the leadership in Piscataway had the foresight to, to plan ahead, right? They built a canopy over the parking lot at, at Public Safety with the intention of being able to install solar panels on the roof, as they have with some of the other facilities, you know, kind of getting ready for the future, right? Thinking ahead. Um, so that grant will help to install the solar panels uh, on that existing canopy, uh, making it a very cost-effective installation, you know, thanks to the additional grant funding. So my understanding, and I need you to correct me if I'm wrong, that the new solar panels will be on the roof of the community center, the town hall, police headquarters, uh, our Sterling Village, mm -hmm. uh, which is our housing for seniors, the senior center itself, and um, the great news is that in addition to the panels supplying the energy, we're also going to have 28 electric vehicle charging stations. Correct, yeah. All right. And, and so far, the town has had a fabulous experience. Mm -hmm. uh, we have this gorgeous $32 million community center um, and not paid for by a single tax dollar, all right, uh, that everybody's using and everybody loves. But outside of the community center, uh, there is a, about eight charging stations. Mm -hmm. I use the community center, although you can't tell. I mean, I'm not doing enough exercise, but uh, I use it frequently. Uh, the eight charging stations that are next to the community center, mm -hmm. they're never empty. Yeah. Doesn't matter, sure. morning, afternoon, night, people are charging up. Mm -hmm. And I have to believe that with the 28 new uh, charging stations, for example, over at the senior housing, et cetera, it makes it easier for citizens to get a charge. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it will be a, 
uh, a big selling point mm -hmm. for uh, the citizens to get into the EV business. Uh, it, now you guys do charging stations everywhere, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you? What's the selling point to an EV and using charging stations? Uh, well, there's there's really a number of different ways to look at it. I mean, I think um, you know, in general, if we're talking about sustainability, if you're if you're using an electric vehicle, it's it's more sustainable. I think there's you know some some different opinions on that, but the the facts are are, are pretty straight especially if you're using solar on site to charge the electric vehicles. So most of these community facilities, uh, they're used during the day, right? So folks are going to be charging their vehicles during the day uh, when the solar is producing the most amount of electricity and producing more than those buildings need. So, uh, you know, any electric vehicle that's going to be plugged in is, is almost certainly going to be charged uh, by the solar. So I think environmentally, uh, it's a huge benefit. And I think also um, just helping the community, you know, I think seeing how well um, utilized those charges at the community center are was a big driver for you know the mayor the administration to say we've got the community here who's already got electric vehicles let's you know let's make it easier to use the community facilities uh, and be able to charge those vehicles so uh, you know similarly we looked at all the facilities and the administration mapped out uh, where to put the new charging stations how many of them to put uh, and really did it in a comprehensive fashion you know a lot of folks are putting one here, putting two there, but I think the approach of really going across the board and making a commitment uh, to, to allow residents to uh, not have to worry about, you know, do they have a place to charge if they go to the community center or to the library or to, you know, the town hall or public safety building. So, um, you know, really kind of laying the, the framework and, and the foundation and you know, also keeping the door open, right? Getting the infrastructure out there to where if you need to add another charger down the line, We've got the conduit, we've got the electrical there to hopefully grow as the uh, adoption of EVs uh, hopefully increases uh, in the community. Right, and the, the national sales numbers are that EVs are a growing segment of the car mm -hmm. sales in the United States. Uh, there's little hesitation about long distance EVs. Mm -hmm. There's a thing called range anxiety yep. where uh, a citizen traveling, say, to Indiana is a little worried that they're going to be able to charge on the way to Indiana and back. Mm -hmm. But um, that is being addressed. Uh, mm -hmm. You have Tesla putting in 30,000 uh, fast chargers across the highway system. There's already about 15,000. In the IRA, President mm -hmm. uh, Biden's infrastructure bill for, uh, for global climate change, there's a big incentive to do more mm -hmm. fast chargers around the country. But for the small trips, mm -hmm. like the the, the plug-in hybrids are very easy, um, not and not so expensive. But now that they're mm -hmm. selling uh, quite well, and there's a little bit of a rebate left. And of mm -hmm. course, the other big thing with EVs is that you're not buying gasoline. Yeah. You're not producing carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, it's even less of a cost. Mm -hmm. The rough rule that I've heard, and maybe you can confirm it, is that about your your uh, miles per get not per gallon but mm -hmm. miles per kilowatt hour yeah. whatever the unit is is the you get an almost immediate savings mm -hmm. that it costs about 60 percent for the electricity mm -hmm. that it would cost for a full tank of gas mm -hmm. to get the same miles traveled does that sound about yeah this? yeah that's yeah that that's exactly uh you know what i understand and um you know there are still places to charge for free and even if you're paying you know, uh, to, to plug in your vehicle, you're still seeing that 60% of, of, right. of what you would expect through a traditional vehicle. And then the other big selling point is maintenance. Yeah. What's the maintenance on an EV? I mean, it's close to nothing. It's got, I believe, and, and this may need to be fact-checked, but I think about a tenth of the number of moving parts compared to what you see in an internal combustion engine. So just the points of failure is significantly less, uh, you know, oil changes, and then, you know, what you start to see as a vehicle gets older, there's just a lot fewer points of failure. Right, and the reason we're doing this, mm -hmm. this is not to drive people into a whole new culture, no mm -hmm. pun intended with that either, but to reduce our carbon dioxide footprint. Yeah. Transportation is one of the two largest sources mm -hmm. of carbon dioxide that's going into the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide is a gas that traps heat, mm -hmm. and that's what's making the planet rise in temperature. Yeah. So. EVs are a blessing, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, my role, I have a role, I'm a state senator after being mayor of Piscataway and an assemblyman, and I 
have chaired the Senate Environment and Energy Committee. Mm. So I see these issues all the time. And mm. I don't know if Schneider is aware of it or not, but in New Jersey, the law is that when you build new housing, mm -hmm. you have to have a certain amount of charging stations. Mm. All right, they have to be wired up for charging stations. Mm. If you build a new industrial facility, a logistics facility, warehouse for a common name, 40% of the roof has to be pre-wired for solar. Hmm. And again, there's the same requirement for EV charging stations at mm -hmm. the site. Uh, the state of New Jersey is currently trying to provide incentives for large industrial users mm -hmm. to do what's called a fleet conversion. Mm -hmm. So think about this. You have cars and or trucks at an industrial facility. You have the solar panels on the roof and they're providing the electricity for the charging. Mm. Saves lots of money for uh, both the company and it prevents the air pollution associated with carbon dioxide. Mm. So we have a, I think, we, yeah. Yeah, I think we have a good future ahead of us yeah. if we can just get it to happen faster. Yeah. Right, global exactly. climate change I think is kind of beating us to the finish line at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly dire, as you mentioned, right, with some of the stats out there and some of the changes we're seeing, you know, increasing severity of, of natural disasters. Um, and I think a lot of folks like to think in a long-term perspective, right? This is a problem that's been been, been building for decades. Uh, you know, a lot of, whether you look at states, companies, local governments are setting targets 10 years, 20 years, you know, 30 years down the line, right? We've got a 2030 or a 2050 net zero plan or carbon neutral plan. Which I think can be valuable, but I, but, I, but I also think you can make progress in a short window of time, right? I mean, if we look at Piscataway here, uh, we really only started talking about this with the township uh, maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a lot of engineering, development, you know, coming up with what's the scope, how much can the township save, how are we going to finance this project. But really in a one to two time, you know, one to two year period, Lots um, of progress. Yeah, we're able to develop a project and then implement over about a one to two year period. So, you know, people are saying in 10 years, in 20 years, this is where we want to be. But in three, you know, three, four years, you can make significant progress. And the, the number I've heard on this, when mm -hmm. we complete this project, mm -hmm. Piscataway Township will have reduced its mm -hmm. carbon footprint by 53%. Yeah. Unbelievable. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, what, I mean, what leadership? I, mm -hmm. I, uh, Politicians always compliment other politicians, but I have to say Mayor Waller and his team have been unbelievably mm -hmm. responsive to climate change. Mm -hmm. And I see more and more EVs in Piscataway. I think our citizens are mm -hmm. sensitized to it. And we all care about our grandchildren. Yeah. You know, what, what kind of a place, what kind of a planet are we going to leave them mm -hmm. if we don't radically change? And it's not radically. Mm -hmm. If we don't make changes to the way in which we do business. Yeah. What do you think? Hundred percent. I mean, I, I I agree completely. I think, um, yeah. I mean, it's it's a short period of time to make a fifty three percent reduction. Oof. You know, you can do that if you have a local community who supports it uh, and and the leadership and and you spend the time. But it's it's very doable. You know, we've got multiple other uh, public entities in right. New Jersey that have seen similar you know similar results forty percent, fifty percent reduction over just a few year period. Um, and I think another thing to add is you know folks might be thinking, okay, well, what's you know, what's the cost of that? I think in this case, you know, we're always having to make a, a, a business justification, right? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, township leadership has to be responsible to taxpayers and making sure that financially this is, this is a good move. Um, and, and, and it is, right? I mean, I think if we look at the return on the investment with, with the solar, with the efficiency, uh, it, it more than covers the cost of the project. Absolutely. And if you look at you know, a, a very comprehensive project, in this case around $23 million for the township, over half of that cost is paid for with the outside savings. incentives. You've got the, you mentioned Inflation Reduction Act, you know, that'll provide 30% on the cost of the solar. We've got uh, utility rebates from the local utility PSE&G. So really, you know, 13 plus million of the funding is coming from a lot of those different incentive programs and then the balance it, you know, there's more than enough savings, savings to, the to the taxpayers. Exactly. That's what so. government should be thinking all the yep. time. And luckily, we have very, very good leaders in Piscataway Township. Yeah. Uh, Dan, I want to thank you for being thank with you. us tonight. I appreciate it. And I think you've been very, very helpful to understanding it. Up next is Councilwoman Michelle Lombardi, who will close out the show tonight. Whether it's rain, sleet, or snow, or earthquakes, the Piscataway Little League parade goes on. So with that, let's play ball.
morning. Welcome to Piscataway Little League 2024 opening day. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the parents for being involved with your children's lives here, especially in this Little League program and T-ball program. I am truly honored to introduce to you a very special person to throw at our first game ball and her grandson to catch it from Grandma. May I introduce to you Vicki Hudson. She is the mother of Marquise Hudson, who played on the American League Orioles team. One of his coaches was Alan Hudson, Vicki's husband. Sadly, Alan passed away two years ago. Marquise was the Plainfield firefighter who answered his call on January 26, 2024. Piscataway Little League is truly grateful to Alan and Marquise for their time they gave to our children. There's a flag, uh, banner being hung in memory of John Loria Jr. Loria family, that banner will be hung every year and be replaced if it does get ruined. First pitch, challengers, Nate Munsing. T-ball, Mary Brian Waller. joining us on this month's episode of Eye on Piscataway. The town cleanup is on April 20th and the Walk for Your Health with Commissioner Chanel Scott McCullum May 4th on Green Acres. Join me next month for another episode of Eye on Piscataway. Have a great month.